Are you woke? Well, that means you're racist. Wokeism is racism. I'll make the case. Also, investigative journalist Julie Kelly joins me to talk about January 6th, the sham, the scandal, the FBI setup. This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. Needs this voice. The times are crazy in a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. We hear a lot about being woke these days. Uh, woke corporations, um, students on campus, or professors who think that they're woke. And I want to make the case that wokeism is racism. Now, wokeism presents itself uh, in the opposite mode. It presents itself as a move away from bigotry, from racism to enlightenment. Uh, To be woke is to undergo a certain kind of transformation, a conversion experience. But I want to argue that the conversion experience is not away from bigotry, but toward bigotry. That when you become woke, you actually develop a stronger racial consciousness You begin to think about people in racial terms and you have a hidden but nevertheless unmistakable foundation, a foundational assumption of black inferiority. Now, here is um, Don Lemon, the host of CNN, uh, complaining about racism. Uh, In an interview with The Washington Post, he says, I don't know if America sees black people and especially black gay men as fully human. He's putting the blame here on America. Americans don't see blacks as fully human. And in general, when people try to blame America on the left, uh, they appeal to American history. They go, wait a minute, Dinesh, uh, look at the three-fifths clause in the Constitution which declares that blacks are only worth three-fifths of a human being. That is the sort of prima facie evidence uh, typically supplied. And it's based upon a complete fallacy because the argument between the North and the South, the Northern and Southern states, uh, had to do with political representation. How many congressmen, how many representatives each side gets. Now, the North, the North, which is the anti-slavery side, wanted blacks to count for zero. Why? Because it wanted to reduce the political power of the Southern states. The South, which wanted more congressmen, more representation, in order to protect its slave interests, the southern states wanted blacks to count for one. So you see right away that the, although the three-fifths number that was agreed upon was a kind of compromise, a compromise to kind of bring the two sides together and get a union, that number, whatever you think of the compromise, had nothing to do with the intrinsic worth of blacks or African Americans at all. So this is a this is simply a canard, one of those sort of historical lies that has embedded itself in left-wing consciousness. But moving away uh, a little bit from history for a moment, uh, we turn now to Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. This is the Democratic senator from uh, Rhode Island, who evidently still belongs to an all-white beach club. Uh, Not only does he belong to it, but it's been repeatedly brought to his attention over the last several years, and he's still, through his family, a member. He was asked about this recently. Listen. Okay, back in 2017, you had expressed concerns about the membership of the all-white Bailey's Beach Club, said that you hoped it would become more diverse. Now, your family's been members, your wife is one of the largest shareholders. Has there been any traction in that? Are there any minority members of the club now? I think the people who are running the place are still working on that, and I'm sorry it hasn't happened yet. Um, Do you have concerns in 2021? I mean, obviously, it's been four years. You had remarks on the floor following the deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd saying, you know, hoping to root out systemic racism in the country. Um, Your thoughts on an elite, all-white, wealthy club, again, in this day and age, um, you know, should these clubs continue to exist? It's a long tradition. What? It's a long tradition? That's your that's your defense? I mean, this guy must know that he only gets away with this kind of thing because he's he's a Democrat. I mean, can you imagine if uh, if the roles were reversed? Uh, Ted Cruz belongs to an all white beach club. Um, Hey, Senator Cruz, are you going to quit? No. Why not? 
Well, it's a long tradition in Texas. That would never happen. Cruz would resign immediately from the club. Um, but in this case, you've got a guy who obviously see and look at his confident tone. He's as a what's the big deal? Uh, it's a tradition in Rhode Island. I want to be part of that tradition. So what if bigotry is part of the tradition? Um, you know, that's that's me. Now, it turns out that this club, which is called the Bailey Beach Club, um, doesn't apparently have any blacks. And there was an interview uh, some time ago, actually several years ago, in which they interviewed one of the members and they go, yeah, we, you know, we got Jews, but quote, blacks, not really, a woman named Miss Oswald said. So it's not that they have a rule against blacks, they just don't have any blacks in the club. And apparently when this was brought to the attention of White House some years ago in 2010, he quote, resigned, but it was a fake resignation. Why? Because he transferred his membership to his wife. And not only is his wife now the member, but she's apparently one of the club's biggest shareholders. So to the degree that the club represents white supremacy, she's investing in it. This is White House. Now, the thing about this guy White House is that in a way, you'd have to say that he fits in with a democratic tradition of bigotry. And we see this all over the place. You know, here's here's Hunter Biden, turns out, casually using the N-word. It's right. It's all over his computer. Uh, and he, st- he calls white guys the N-word. And think about it. If Hunter Biden uses that kind of language so casually, he probably used it at home. The Bidens knew about it. They didn't mind. If they did, look at the way they fight against bigotry elsewhere. Oh, we're against bigotry. We're fighting against racism. But in your own family, it's perfectly okay. Let's remember Hillary and Barack Obama both called Robert Byrd. By the way, this guy was the exalted Cyclops of the Ku Klux Klan. And Hillary calls him her mentor. Biden spoke at his funeral. Biden, by the way, has also talked in avuncular terms about how he palled around with segregationists. These are, by the way, democratic segregationists, the so-called Dixiecrats, and their buildings named after them in Washington, D.C. So this is this shows you that it isn't merely historically that the Democrats are the party of bigotry. They're the party of bigotry right now. They're, and, and they condone bigotry. When White House made these comments, uh, Breitbart News contacted the NAACP, no comment. The Black Caucus, no comment. So suddenly all these civil rights groups, which are otherwise militant, Al Sharpton's flying in on his private jet, they go dead silent when it's their own team. In other words, they overlook bigotry when it occurs on the Democratic side, almost as if they kind of uh, expect it. Now, the reason that wokeism is racism at its core is it has a built-in assumption of black inferiority. If you listen to these woke people talk, you realize that they don't expect anything, and I mean anything, out of blacks. Uh, they say things like, well, we can't, we can't expect blacks to be on time. That's because the concept of time is kind of a Western concept. Uh, we can't expect blacks to get an ID. Everybody else gets an ID, but somehow for blacks, getting an ID is like unbelievably strenuous. It's tough to get IDs, you know, if you're black. Uh, Black people aren't expected to do math. Uh, They can't think in a linear way, apparently. And so you've got all these woke critiques of math. Math proceeds logically one step to another. That's kind of a white man's way of thinking. And again and again, when it comes to university admission standards, the expectation is that if they were meritocratic, well, pretty much no blacks would get in. If PhD programs were meritocratic, they would essentially be made up largely of whites and Asians with a sprinkling of Hispanics. Uh, When it comes to jobs, when it comes to government contracts, when it comes to promotions, when it comes to pretty much everything, blacks have got to be treated differently than every other group. It's almost as if, you know, Booker T. Washington, the great black leader, once talked about the American standard. And what he meant by this is the American competitive standard. To get ahead in America, you've got to compete. It's sort of like a national Olympics at all kinds of levels. But it's almost as if wokeism presumes that for blacks, you don't have an American standard. You have to set up a separate black standard. You can't have an American Olympics. You have to set up a kind of special Olympics. You've got to treat blacks in the way that, for example, athletic programs treat special needs kids. And this is terrible. This is, in fact, racism in its most corrosive form. Why? Because the built-in assumption is that these people, African Americans, are not as good as everyone else. They are not just socially or culturally, but they are naturally, they are by virtue of being black, not only inferior, but expected to be inferior. 
For this reason, I believe that wokeism is today the most insidious contemporary embodiment of racism. I want to continue my discussion of wokeism by now talking about conservative wokeism. You might think that wokeism is exclusively a phenomenon of the left, but not always. There is a certain camp on the right. These are sort of the, the Bush guys, but they're also a certain, a certain type of evangelical Christian that is tempted by woke ideology. Not entirely, but is nevertheless sufficiently attracted to it to try to make a certain kind of compromise or even partial embrace of it. I want to analyze an article that just appeared in the Washington Post. It's by Michael Gerson, one of the uh, top speechwriters, maybe the head speechwriter for um, George W. Bush, and, um, and also an evangelical Christian. The article is called, I'm a conservative who believes systemic racism is real. Now, let's look at this article and a few of its key lines to try to analyze what's going on. He begins by saying, I don't think it's possible to be a conservative without believing that racism is in part structural. I think what he's uh, getting at here is that uh, racism isn't merely uh, historically an individual phenomenon. It's obviously uh, an institutional phenomenon. And I agree. I agree to the extent that racism is an institutional phenomenon embodied in the codes and practices and history and ideology of the Democratic Party. That is the institution that was the conduit for white racism. Prior to the Civil War, it was the institution that upheld slavery, it was the champion of slavery, both in the North and in the South. Uh, even the Northerners, in other words, were the party of the plantation. They protected slaveholder interests in the South and were recognized to do that. And after the Civil War, the Democratic Party became the party of racial terrorism and also the party of segregation. So given all this, it's a little peculiar that Gerson makes no mention of the Democratic Party at all. He keeps talking about the fact that a phenomenon is structural, but he doesn't say what is the structure that upheld it. He gives, he lets you believe, and we'll come back to this, that the structure is in fact America. And this is his, you might say, his big lie. Now he goes on to say that a lot of people tend to view racism as an individual act of immorality. And they look at responsibility for success and failure as personal and not sort of collective. Now, I think when it comes really to, um, and I think Michael Gerson would understand this very well, when you're thinking about your soul, when you're thinking about the concept of sin, when you're thinking about wrongdoing, uh, it is difficult to think of wrong, wrongdoing except in individual terms. In other words, what is my complicity in this? So let's say, for example, that India goes to war with Pakistan. Um, I don't bear responsibility for that just by being Indian. Uh, now, obviously, if I supported the war, I was part of the government, I was part of the decision to go to war, it's a whole different matter. But to merely ascribe a guilt or even responsibility for the war just by virtue of me sharing the skin color of the people who d made that decision, this is downright ludicrous. And I think Gerson would probably have to agree with that. Now, he goes on to talk about the fact that he grew up in St. Louis and he grew up kind of on the white side of the tracks. And he says that it was only as he got older that he came to realize that this notion of the white side of the tracks and the black side of the tracks uh, was a result of white flight. Whites kind of running away from the inner cities and establishing suburban neighborhoods. And he seems to attribute all of this to racism. Now, the reason that this is, I think, quite preposterous is that what we have seen is flight away from inner cities, not only by whites, but by every single ethnic group. We have white flight, but now uh, social scientists talk about black flight. Just look at places like Baltimore or Washington, D.C. Um, there are prosperous, middle-class black, and now Asian, and even Latino neighborhoods outside the inner city. These are all people fleeing horrible schools. They're fleeing crime. This cannot be in a simplistic way attributed to racism. But yet Gerson goes on to say, quote, this is what I mean by systemic racism. Now, once again, the question he never asks is, who is running St. Louis? 
Who is making those schools so bad? Who is destroying, if you will, the black family that is the root of all those social problems? The reason people join gangs is they don't belong or they don't have intact families. Now, once again, Gerson might simplistically say, and you, you get the idea he's talking about something he doesn't know a lot about. Well, Dinesh, the breakdown of the black family, that goes back to slavery. Well, actually, Michael Gerson, it doesn't. Uh, because at the end of slavery, the illegitimacy rate for blacks, this was computed by the black scholar W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, was around 20%. This is in about 1905. Uh, the black illegit illegitimacy rate began to climb dramatically starting in the 1960s. It, re it started off around 25% and it's now close to 70 or 75%. So this really uh, cataclysmic breakdown of the black family has occurred in the last 40 or 50 years. It has occurred in a time of complete democratic control of these inner cities. So they bear the responsibility. You want to find structural racism, Michael Gerson? There it is. Uh, being a conservative, uh, Gerson says, means taking history seriously. This is the kind of pompous statement that makes me recoil. So much as I like Gerson personally, I think this is embarrassing for the simple reason that he doesn't take history seriously. He keeps talking about, he, his favorite word is we. We are also the country that has done this. We are also the country that's done that. And he goes, he makes a distinction. We may not be to blame, but we do have responsibility. But my point is, who's we? You know, the problem here is history is about particulars. America doesn't do things. The whole country doesn't jump up and do something. There are people in the country that do it. History is about particulars. It's not we, it's who, it's when, it's what, it's why. So what you have here, I think, is one of those, uh, I think, smarmy, pharisaical uh, ascriptions of self-responsibility and national guilt which is an attempt, I think, to evade, if not to cover up, the fact that the Democratic Party is responsible. They bear the blame. They should pay the reparations. They're the guilty party. Why lift the responsibility off the people who did it and try to put it on the people who didn't? So, guys, we're now entering the last phase of the Dinesh... My Pillow book and movie deal. Uh, you should know that this um, offer closes on July 4th. So it's time to spring into action. Uh, this is, I'm working with the folks at My Pillow to carry this out. And uh, here's the deal uh, you go all out and buy $250, $500, or $1,000 of My Pillow merchandise. And this is not hard to do. Because this guy will outfit your entire home. He has more than a hundred great products from his classic premium pillows to the Giza Dream Sheets, the MyPillow robes, the MyPillow mattress topper, the MyPillow dog beds, the list goes on. Now here's the fun part. If you spend $250, I'll send you a copy of one of my recent books, one of my favorites, personally autographed to you. If you spend $500, you get two signed books plus two of my movies. And if you spend $1,000 or more, you get four signed books and four movies, the mini Dinesh Collection. Call 800-876-0227 or go to MyPillow.com and use promo code Dinesh. What else do you have to do to kind of take advantage of this offer? Well, really nothing. I'll get the info from the MyPillow guys. I'll send the books to the same address that you use for your merchandise. Again, the offer ends July 4th, so please act now. Again, that number 800-876-0227 or go to MyPillow.com. Make sure to use promo code D-I-N-E-S-H Dinesh. I'm really happy to welcome back to the podcast the investigative writer and author, Julie Kelly. Julie writes for the website American Greatness. She's been doing really important work on January 6th. Julie, uh, thanks for coming back on the program. Uh, let me start by asking you about this revolver uh, expose that uh, suggests the possibility that the FBI might have uh, incited or perhaps even orchestrated January 6th. Uh, the Revolver people point out that A, the FBI has certainly done it before. They were actively involved in the so-called Whitmer kidnapping slash assassination plot. There were, I believe, out of 14 people arrested. Five of them were FBI operatives or agents. 
Uh, and then second, the uh, FBI, um, the plot leaders of January 6th, in some cases have not even been charged. So it's not as if they gave immunity to the little fish to go after the big fish. Some of the big fish supposedly have been left off the table here, raising the question of whether these are guys who actually work for the FBI. Now, some um, critics, including some conservatives, have said, wait a minute, uh, this can't all be true. It misses the important legal distinction between an FBI operative on the one hand and an unindicted co-conspirator on the other hand, that the FBI manual makes a separation between the two, but you write, in fact, you write today in American Greatness that we can't trust the FBI to follow these procedures. So uh, explain. Well, I mean, Dinesh, we were also told that the FBI would never mislead the FISA court and use paid political propaganda as evidence to get a warrant to spy on an American citizen. We were also told the FBI would never run informants or confidential human uh, sources into the Trump campaign. Of course, they did that, too. So basically, everything we've been told the FBI would never do over the past five years, they've done exactly that and more so. You know, it's funny, at the same time, this is all breaking. You have people defending the FBI. We now know that the primary subsource uh, for the dossier, the Steele dossier, which is coming out this week, is confirmed a fraud and a liar. But the FBI never did did anything about it. Um, and so here we are, fast forward five years from the launch of Crossfire Hurricane. Uh, and here we are with the, the likelihood that the FBI was not only involved in January 6th, but helped incite and instigate exactly what happened that day by using groups such as the Oath Keepers, perhaps the Proud Boys, Three Percenters, these groups that are on the FBI's hit list for whatever reason. And now they finally have their optics. They've got their show trials to prove up the Trump supporters are domestic violent extremists and pose the greatest threat to the country, as Chris Ray has said. Julie, we think of the FBI as corrupted under the Obama administration. I think to a degree it certainly was, but it appears that the problems go even further back. I was a little startled to see uh, in Glenn Greenwald's reporting that going back to the Bush years, this is George W. Bush, um, that the FBI was, uh, in a sense, doing the same thing uh, to people that they alleged to be terrorists. They would catch a couple of guys. They would say, oh, we foiled a plot. These are people who are going to Syria to join ISIS. And it turns out, you know, one of these guys has no money. Another guy's mom uh, had his passport. So what the FBI was doing is taking people who maybe were disposed to radical Islam, but weren't dreaming of joining anything, fighting anywhere or going anywhere. And the FBI puts them up to it. The FBI goes, why don't you go to Syria? Why don't you join ISIS? We'll provide this. We'll provide. And then when the guy go, okay, they grab him, they arrest them. You know, they put out these self-congratulatory press releases. We and the FBI foiled a horrible plot. I mean, this is very scary stuff and makes us, I think, rethink even some of uh, the previous policies that I certainly did. And I don't know if you did support under the Bush years that went under the banner of the war against terror. My point is that these crooks were at it even then. They sure were. And I do think this is another eye opener for people on the right. Uh, you know, we supported the Patriot Act. We supported using the, these surveillance tools against who we believed were foreign terrorists. Well, who's the common denominator in all of this? Robert Mueller. He was George Bush's in 2003, I believe, appointed FBI director. There was a reason Barack Obama wanted him to stay past his 10 year tenure. And who followed up in Robert Mueller's footsteps? His buddy, James Comey, who ended up being special counsel, Robert Mueller. So um, the, a lot of this, you could see the continuation between what happened under the Bush administration through the Obama administration and now holdovers or loyalists um, under now uh, Joe Biden. And so this is, uh, it's really alarming to read that Revolver News has another follow-up piece published Tuesday that outlines more of these terrorist plots that uh, were concocted and tri executed by the FBI. And so it's really a shame though, Dinesh, when we had the opportunity to overhaul the FBI, when Donald Trump had the chance to fire Chris Ray to really clean house at the Justice Department and FBI, he didn't do it. And so that was such a lost opportunity. And now we see that this war against Americans now is accelerated under Merrick Garland's Justice Department. 
Do you think, Julie, that if the January 6th defendants or some of them were to make it as part of their defense that we were set up by the FBI, that this would force the FBI's hand? In other words, the FBI would then have to produce discovery and would have to make the case that, no, these aren't our people. So I'm trying to find a way to find out for sure if the FBI was behind this or not. Would this be an effective legal tactic to, you may say, flush them out? If only, if only these people had attorneys who were representing them, a lot of them are not within, have any means to hire attorneys on their own. They're at the mercy of public defenders or court appointed attorneys um, who are indoctrinating them with race. There was just a story in the Huffington Post. I don't know if you saw it. A court appointed attorney who was forcing their client, January 6th defendant, to read and watch movies about America's genocidal and racist history. So those are the kinds of attorneys that these people have. It's really sad. So even if an attorney brought that up in court, you're also talking about the same swamp judges, Emmett Sullivan, Amy Berman Jackson, we've talked about this, Beryl Howell, the same judges who were trying to go after Trump and his people for four years, they are at the mercy. I mean, these defendants are at the mercy of these judges too. So they haven't even presented a lot of discovery. These uh, cases continue to get 60 day exemptions from the Speedy Trial Act with approval from defense attorneys. They haven't even built their cases. So to, to the extent that we would ever find out in court that the FBI was involved, I, I highly doubt it considering what I've seen and watched so far. More with Julie Kelly when we come back. If you're thinking of replacing your carpets due to pet stains and odors, you got to try Genesis 950. The reviews are incredible. This is one product that actually works. Now, with water, it breaks down the bonds of stains and odors so they are gone for good. Its antibacterial component removes pet odors from carpet and padding. It can be used in a carpet cleaning machine, and it's green, so it's safe for your family and pets. Genesis 950 is made in America. One gallon of industrial-strength Genesis 950 makes up to seven gallons of cleaner. But Genesis 950 is also great for bathrooms, floors, upholstery, and grease stains. Debbie uses it to clean the entire kitchen. When I got chocolate on my pants and on the couch, Genesis 950, whoops, took it right off. Genesis 950 has great customer service. Order one gallon direct at Genesis950.com. You'll get a free spray bottle, free shipping, and a $10 coupon code using the code Dinesh. That's Genesis950.com. Coupon only available for one gallon purchase. Genesis 950, it's much cheaper than replacing your carpets or your pants or your couch. I'm back with investigative reporter Julie Kelly. We're talking about the um, the scam, the scandal, the perhaps the setup that was January 6th. Uh, Julie, it seems to me we're dealing here with a kind of Reichstag fire event. The Reichstag fire, of course, 1933, somebody burned down the German parliament. Uh, but the Nazis, and we're talking about the early Nazis with Hitler, they were able to use this in order to pass the Enabling Act, which gave them emergency powers across the whole society. They were able to suspend civil liberties. Isn't there a kind of, without saying Democrats are Nazis, I'm not saying that, I'm saying isn't there a parallel between the Reichstag fire, the exploitation of that event, to create a nationwide system of, of, of shutdown and fear and militarization, suspension of civil liberties, isn't this a legitimate parallel to what's going on in America? It absolutely is, Dinesh. I mean, they are using January 6th now as a pretext to pursue and achieve longtime goals of the Democratic Party, which is basically to criminalize political dissent, to silence uh, political dialogue. They're using the FBI now to, to go on this nationwide manhunt for protesters, Trump supporters. This is now going to reach the Department of Homeland Security. It also has been targeted by the Director of National Intelligence outside of her scope, which is to use her intelligence authority to go after foreign terrorists, not Americans. Um, and so now they're gonna pour another $100 million at least into the Justice Department to go after domestic violent extremists. So it sure does look like uh, a big part of this was manufactured, orchestrated, and executed, and now exploited by Democrats 
uh, who have all the power right now to pursue long time goals to crush the right. Julie, the, the underlying a theme of the Democrats. We saw this in Alejandro Mayorkas. We saw this from Merrick Garland. I'm not just talking about the absurd analogies to 9-11 or the Oklahoma City bombing, but the basic idea was that these people who went to the Capitol were plotting sedition. They were trying to overthrow the government. Now, is it not a fact that A, not one of these defendants has been charged with sedition, uh, and B, there's a, a second and much more obvious explanation of what they were trying to do, which is they were basically trying to get their voices heard about an election tally that they believed had been rigged, had been sort of or, uh, manipulated. So far from trying to overthrow the government, they were trying to demand that there be a fair accounting. Isn't that the, if you had to ascribe a collective motive to the people who went in the Capitol, is that not what they were up to? It is. Um, and, you know, when you talk to people who were there that day, they're very upset because the events of that day, as they will explain, stopped what they wanted, which was a fair assessment of what had happened in those states, the 10 day audit, which some of the senators were looking at or supporting. So that brought all of that to a screeching halt. Um, and so that's what the people who were there that day are really upset about. They said, you know, we would never do this. It completely upended our entire goal that day, which leads you to believe, well, then it was successful. So who participated in it? Who did it? And why did it happen? Um, but back to our point about the FBI, what's happening in these investigations, uh, especially the Oath Keepers case, why now do we have up to 16 defendants who have been charged, um, but you have now 20 un unidentified people who haven't been charged? So we could talk a little bit about that case. But for anyone to dismiss the FBI's involvement uh, to now pursue longtime goals of the Democratic Party and the FBI, um, it just cannot be dismissed that they were a big part of, of what happened. Julie, they present, uh, to look at even the media accounts of this, you get the idea that the Oath Keepers were this sort of militarized wing that was marching in military formation with camouflage fatigues. Talk about what the Oath Keepers actually did. How, a, how long were they in the Capitol? B, how much damage did they do? How many people did they assault? How much property did they did destroy? So they're going after this group as if it's basically Al-Qaeda. Uh, what, in fact, do we know about the Oath Keepers' actual participation in January 6th? Um, you know, I have to say, Dinesh, reading their stories, it, uh, some of it's pretty heartbreaking. They're kind of sad stories. Um, a lot of them are veterans. One of them is severely disabled. Uh, he's a former Navy uh, commander, Lieutenant Thomas Caldwell, who they said was a co-conspirator in all this. He's been charged. What they did, Dinesh, they wore some military, some of them wore military-ish uh, uh, clothing. They entered the Capitol in a stack formation. They stayed in there for less than 20 minutes. They did not assault a police officer. They didn't put their hands on anyone. Um, they didn't vandalize the property. They aren't charged with vandalizing directly any property. They didn't steal anything. They took some pictures. They had no weapons on them and they left. For that, their lives are being destroyed. Uh, two of them remain in the deplorable jail, as I call it. They were arrested in January. Their lives have been destroyed. Their families uh, hung out to dry. Their businesses bankrupted. Uh, you see prosecutors bragging about this in some of the court uh, hearings, court documents, that they're so happy with themselves for destroying these people's lives. But they did nothing wrong. They could not... I mean, with all due respect to these people, they couldn't organize, you know, knocking off a lemonade stand, let alone trying to halt, you know, the trans peaceful transfer of power or whatever rhetoric that uh, the, the uh, Democrats and media are using. So the whole conspiracy case against them is laughable. Uh, here's uh, the testimony of a woman named Jessica Bustle, um, not an Oath Keeper as I understand it. She and her husband are sort of anti-vaxxer types. They're worried about the COVID lockdowns. But I think it's telling because from her statement, this is the stuff that she posted on her own social media. You get a real window before she was arrested of what actually happened and how she felt about it. She says, quote, we were let in. 
I'm cool. When we finally decided to head over to the Capitol, we were let in. Like literally, my husband and I just, quote, in all caps, walked right in with tons of other people. Then she says, the cops were nice. We were talking with them, all caps, inside of the Capitol. Uh, there were no guns, weapons, no violence. In fact, she says, when we finally decided to go in after about 45 minutes of it being wide open, I want to highlight what we're getting here is the idea that you got these people, they show up at the Capitol, they're obviously part of a crowd, the doors are open, there are cops walking around. If these cops said, get out of here, you're not, it's unauthorized, leave immediately, presumably a bunch of these people would have left, but no, the cops were chatting, they were kind of doing their own thing, people are taking pictures. I mean, this whole thing... I, I gotta say, it gives you it gives you a very queasy feeling, and it almost makes you think that something there's something bigger uh, going on here. Almost as if this is something that the cops were okay with, and somebody might have even put them up to it. What do you, what do you think? Um, I I know we sound <laughs> a little unhinged here. Uh, as far as the FBI, but look, U.S. Capitol Police, for the most part, are bad actors in this as well. Um, we know that they were letting people in. We know that they lied about what happened to Brian Sicknick. They continue to lie about it. We know that they are trying to cover up and conceal 14,000 hours of surveillance video that their security system captured that should really belong to the American people. So for the most part, they look as complicit as the Democrats and FBI and possibly executing this. And so, but look, Ron Johnson sent a letter. He has seen a lot of this video, his staff. He asked uh, the acting chief of police for U.S. Capitol Police about a clip of video that they saw where in front of U.S. Capitol Police officer, five people opened double doors on the West Terrace, I believe, and let up to 300 people in while the Capitol Police were standing right there. And so those are the sort of questions that need to be asked. They need to be answered um, because we can't see all of this surveillance video. So we have to rely on the people who do see it to tell us uh, what they saw. So that's one little clip. But you know this, Tanesh, a lot of people who were there said we were let in. They had pictures with cops. We see people in the rope lines, and I believe it was Statutory Hall. But look, a lot of these people have never been to the Capitol before. So, and it's a huge area. I mean, as you know, but a lot of people don't. It's a huge complex. And so the idea that they saw an open door and they saw police there, okay, go ahead in. And then to have the FBI track them down, arrest them, uh, and treat them like criminals and, uh, you know, prosecute them on ridiculous trespassing and disorderly conduct charges while we have cities across the country completely burning down, melting down under violent crime. Um, you just cannot believe that this is something that our FBI is fixated on, but it is. When we come back, I want to talk to Julie Kelly about the responsibility of the GOP and what can be done to stand up for these people who are quite honestly political prisoners. Did you know that a third of Americans regularly suffer from nausea? My wife Debbie had a terrible time flying. Do you know how embarrassing it is to throw up on an airplane? I couldn't get to the bag quick enough. I really dreaded flying. That is until I found this great device that took away my nausea and I don't go on an airplane without it. And that device is Relief Band. Relief Band is the number one FDA-cleared anti-nausea wristband that has been clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively prevent nausea and vomiting associated with motion sickness, anxiety, migraine, hangover, morning sickness, chemotherapy, and so much more. The product is 100% drug-free, non-drowsy, and provides all-natural relief with zero side effects for as long as needed. The technology was originally developed over 20 years ago in hospitals to relieve nausea from patients, but now through Relief Band, it's available to you. Relief Band stimulates a nerve in the wrist that travels to the part of the brain that controls nausea. Then it blocks the signal your brain is sending to your stomach telling you that you are sick. It makes a great gift for that special person in your life that suffers from nausea. Thank you, honey. <laughs> it's worked for me, and it can work for you. As the world's um, opening back up, don't let the fear of nausea keep you on the sidelines. Right now, Relief Band is an exclusive offer just for 
Dinesh D'Souza listeners go to reliefband.com and use promo code Dinesh. You'll get 20% off plus free shipping and a no questions asked 30-day money-back guarantee. So head to reliefband.com, that's R-E-L-I-E-F-B-A-N-D.com and use promo code Dinesh. I'm back with investigative writer Julie Kelly, who writes for American Greatness. We're talking about January 6th. Uh, Julie, where is the uh, the GOP on this? I mean, if it's the case that you've got these guys, uh, and of course they put it all on the line for Trump, they put it all on the line to get what they believe was an to get they wanted an accurate count of what happened in the election, um, and uh, here they are sitting, some of them in solitary confinement, other people facing all these charges. These are not by and large rich people. Uh, you could say at the very least they deserve a defense. Um, Let me ask you this. I mean, um, there are so many Republicans from McConnell. I even heard Ted Cruz at one point refer to them as terrorists. Hasn't the GOP kind of sold these people out? Um, Isn't that an accurate statement? I would say sold them out, ignored them, uh, vilified them as you just pointed out. Now, why is that, Julie? Is that because our side is scared that they have, uh, they want to run away from January 6th? Or, or, or do they genuinely believe that these are bad guys who are, who are storming the Capitol? Is it, a, is it sort of a, a, a failure of understanding or is it a failure of nerve? I think probably both, but I'm going to go with the latter. I think that they, for the most part, are afraid of this. They're afraid to touch these people. They uh, consider them uh, deplorables. I mean, let's face it, these are. This is not the base of the Republican Party that, say, Mitch McConnell thought that he, you know, was leading for the past forty years. These are not Mitch McConnell's people. Uh, they're not Kevin McCarthy's people. They're not, uh, you know, a Ben Sass. They, uh, they're beneath uh, them is how they view that. And so that is what I find so offensive is that no one wants to be really connected with defending those folks and what they did. We are starting to see some people, there are House Republicans who are speaking out, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paul Gosar, Louis Gohmert. Uh, we even have seen some harsh questioning by Jim Jordan uh, against Christopher Ray last week. So that's a good sign. Ron Johnson has really started to be on the forefront of this uh, and dragged along only four of his colleagues Uh, Five of them wrote a letter to uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland a week or so ago asking several questions about the discrepancy in handling 2020 protesters versus this. But where where are all of the Republican senators? Every senator should have signed that. Mitch McConnell should have delivered it to Merrick Garland's office. Um, But to the extent we should applaud those who are standing up, that would be Johnson, Mike Lee, uh, and a few others. I mean, Julie, I have to applaud you here because I think the fact of the matter is that in the aftermath of not, of January 6th, there was not, to my knowledge, a single Republican in the House or the Senate prominent who has spoken up on behalf or, or even taken um, the idea that they deserve a full and legitimate defense. Uh, so I'm really glad you're doing what you can. I'm doing what I can to get the word out. Let me ask you a question about Trump, because I think, you know, of course, it was the left's uh, attempt to link Trump, say Trump incited all this. So they were trying to make it seem like they were doing Trump's bidding. Do you think that's the reason that Trump himself has played kind of a backseat here? Because to the degree that he jumps to their defense, he sets up a defense fund, the left goes, see, we told you from the beginning that this was a Trump operation from start to finish. Trump is in a, I must say, in a little bit of a difficult position here. Do you agree? I do. Um, But look, these are people who are there to support him that day and their lives are being destroyed in the process for and being punished for supporting him and speaking out. Um, And so I do think that it's time for Donald Trump to weigh in on this. He cannot ignore this any longer for whatever they're going to say, whatever they're going to say about him or his involvement. Um, But he has still has a powerful voice. He can direct others to pay attention to this. And so I do think that it's time that he speaks out in defense of these people. These are these are their people and their lives are being destroyed and he can really uh, come to their defense and help. So I hope he does. 
I mean, I really don't see, Julie, how any political party can survive in the long term if it doesn't protect. Look at the way the left protects its team. I mean, they will protect people who are so out there, people with long criminal records. I mean, I just saw a huge statue to George Floyd, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, whether or not, and George Floyd, I think, was a victim of injustice, but that doesn't make him a hero. It doesn't make him a role model, you know? And so here you got a guy with a home invader, a guy with a criminal record, passing forged checks, his body full of fentanyl and yet he's the new Martin Luther King as far as the left is concerned. So look at the way they go to the bat to bat for their side. Meanwhile, our guys, when you've got some guy, oh, he was in the Capitol, they run for cover. I mean, there's a huge psychological divide between the two sides, isn't there? You cannot have a political party that abandons its base repeatedly and has such egregious um, things happening to just rank and file regular Americans. Uh, you can't have a political party uh, intact that can face up to the left and Democrats when it won't even defend its own people. I think it's an outrage. I think it just proves once again that the uh, now established Republican Party really needs to be uh, uprooted. Uh, and most of its leadership ousted and completely reformed uh, because these are not people who are defending the American people, rule of law, constitution, et cetera. Uh, and so they just keep continuing to expose that they are not the fighters that we need right now. I totally agree. Julie, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for covering this, Dinesh. Really appreciate it. It's time to talk about our health. Debbie and I have gotten to know Dr. Douglas Howard. He founded the company called Balance of Nature. This is one remarkable guy. Now, he convinced us we're not eating enough fruits and veggies, even though we thought we were. Now, you don't have to eat the stuff you don't like. Turn to the Balance of Nature solution instead. Can you imagine how you'd feel if you were eating 10 servings of fruits and veggies every single day. Debbie started first, and I'm doing it too now. We take six daily capsules, uh, and we're set. These are the fruits right here, and Debbie loves how they smell. Very fruity. Here's the, um, here are the veggies. We get all our vital nutrients sourced from 31 fruits and veggies every day. Debbie also swears by this. This is the... Um, it's called fiber and spice powder. She dissolves it in water. You can also dissolve it in juice. But she says it really helps. She's never been more regular. Now join us and experience the balance of nature difference for yourself. For a limited time, all new preferred customers get an additional 35% discount and free shipping on your first balance of nature order. Use discount code AMERICA. Call 800-246-8751. That's 800-246-8751. Or go to balanceofnature.com and use discount code AMERICA. There are two very interesting items of news coming out of Portland. Yes, we're talking about Portland, Oregon. By the way, the site of the uh, series Portlandia, which makes a kind of wry fun of Portland. But there's nothing funny about what's been going on in Portland over the past year. Incessant rioting, incessant arson, uh, occupations, burnings, even murders. Uh, and all of this uh, with the um, sort of tolerance or look the other way attitude of the Portland um, establishment, Democratic establishment, I hardly need add. And recently, the uh, Portland Voluntary Rapid Response Team, 50 people resigned. Why? Because Portland has imposed charges on a police officer in a, in a matter of Black Lives Matter riots. Apparently, this guy, uh, Officer Corey Budworth, uh, hit an activist on the head with a baton. It was a pure accident. He didn't mean to do it. But nevertheless, he's being treated as a horrible criminal. They're trying to go after him and prosecute him. And so, basically, Portland is, doesn't have right now this rapid response force. Now, Portland, as if to divert attention from all its problems and the fact that it's becoming and has become one of the most unlivable cities in America, literally a horrible place. I'm sure there are all kinds of people in Portland looking to get out of there. Portland takes a full-page ad in the New York Times. Think about it. The city is buying a full-page ad to promote itself and basically go, it's, it's all okay, guys. Come to Portland. Now, let's read a couple of lines from the ad because they're downright funny. Some of what you've heard about Portland is true. Really, all of what you've heard is true. Some is not. This is their way to cover up the bad stuff. What matters most is we're true to ourselves. Really, that's what matters most, you're true to ourselves. This is like, I always think of Adolf Hitler. You may agree with me, you may disagree with me, but what really matters is I'm true to myself. Now, they go on, this is the ad. 
This is the kind of place where new ideas are welcome. Not true. You can speak up here. Not true. You can be yourself here only if you are a leftist, not otherwise. Otherwise, they go after you. They terrorize you and you become a target. We have some of the loudest voices on the West Coast. And yes, passion pushes the volume all the way up. So this is the kind of really disgusting self-congratulation that you have. People have accomplished nothing. Yes, we're passionate, but you know, that's how we are. We've always been like this, quote, we wouldn't have it any other way. Now, this is this ad is so dishonest from start to finish that I had to write my own ad, which is actually actually written by a kind of Antifa guy living in his mom's basement. And this is the real Portland. This is what they really should have put in the New York Times to give a in the name of uh, what they what they did is false advertising. So here's true advertising. My name is Austin. I live in my mom's basement. I've been living here for seven years. I don't have a job. I'm very lonely. My mom doesn't like me. In fact, her nickname for me is Austin the Weirdo. Every now and then, though, I come out. I go, Mom, where's my Halloween costume? I gotta go fight Nazis. Now, to be honest, I've never met a Nazi. Nazis are bad, but I also think Republicans are bad, and therefore, I look at Republicans as Nazis. Now, I like Portland because they let me stop traffic. They let me jump on police cars. I like setting fire to stuff. I was doing, they've been doing this since I was a kid. This is part of the reason that my mom would come and smack me across the face. But, but the police don't do that. The police let me burn cars. That's why I love Portland. In Portland, I can be myself. Now, some will call it the end of civilization. But for me, Austin, Austin the weirdo, I like a place where weirdness is okay. And that's why I like Portland. Court packing, you know, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's very important to do something about it. I want to talk to you about a group that is doing something. Now, court packing is the tool of left-wing authoritarians. Hugo Chavez packed Venezuela's Supreme Court with his socialist cronies and paved the way for his tyrannical regime. And now Joe Biden and America's socialist radicals want to pack our Supreme Court with four new leftist justices. Now, court packing isn't some remedial policy idea to improve the courts. It's a coup. It's a coup to take away your constitutional freedoms and to turn America into a socialist country. Now, this is why the First Liberty Institute, this is the largest legal organization in the nation dedicated to defending religious liberty. We had its uh, top guy, Kelly Shackelford, in our movie Trump Card. Well, First Liberty recently launched SupremeCoup.com to serve as a kind of one-stop shop in the fight against court backing and help patriots like you learn the truth about what is happening in our courts. Now, more importantly, there's a take action button that you can click to do your part to stop the Supreme Court coup. If you want to defend our God-given freedoms and stop the left's court backing scheme, head over to supremecoup.com slash Dinesh. That's S-U-P-R-E-M-E-C-O-U-P dot com slash Dinesh. I want to talk in this segment about the um, great economist Thomas Sowell. There's a new uh, biography of Sowell published by a young writer for the Wall Street Journal. His name is, the writer's name is Jason Riley, and the book is just called Maverick, uh, a biography of Thomas Sowell. Uh, I got to know Tom Sowell because we were both fellows at the, um, at the Hoover Institution, and uh, we'd have, um, you know, lunch periodically. Typically, it was me, but it was also Sowell and his wife, who's also an economist, and Sowell would tell me kind of funny stories about his old days. Um, apparently, I remember one where he was, um, he had published his book, um, he'd written his book, Markets and Minorities, one of his first books. And he says, I sent it in uh, to the publisher. And in those days, uh, you mailed in the manuscript and it was often a very long time before you heard back from the publisher. So says it was almost a year. And he had basically thought, he didn't know what happened to the book. And finally, he says he got back this package in the mail 
and the publisher said that they had accepted it for publication. But he says, as I looked through the manuscript, every page had extensive writing and notes and queries and questions, which is, by the way, normal for publishers to do uh, with a manuscript. But Saul was outraged, and, and basically, he, re he refused to make any changes. He wrote back to the publisher, basically saying, listen, uh, I believe that I am the world's expert on writing my own book. And so either you publish the book as is, uh, but I'm not willing to make uh, any of these edits or respond to some, uh, you know, junior staffer who's come up with all these 300 questions. And so it goes, it was another year before he heard back from the publisher. And then he received a published book in the mail. So they decided, oh, they decided to go for it. But um, this is Sol. He was a very, he was a guy with an independent mind. Um, and Jason Riley tells this very interesting story about him. He grew up under segregation. He grew up poor. Uh, he became a Marxist in his youth. And why? Because he would take the bus um, from the tenements in, on the outskirts of New York down 125th Street, Harlem. And he'd take the bus and it would go right up Fifth Avenue, go up Madison Avenue, and he'd see all these beautiful um, designer stores and all these rich people walking their poodles. And then he'd see the bus go into the horrible, rundown neighborhoods of Harlem and all the tenements and all the suffering, and he'd get off there. And so he goes, wow, Marxism kind of explains why the world is like this. And it was only when Tom Sowell, and we went to Howard University, he was really smart. He was able to transfer from Howard to Harvard. And then, uh, which, was, which was, he said, uh, a move to a much more uh, challenging, more difficult institution. But then he went from Harvard to Chicago, uh, which he said was the most difficult and demanding of all. And Chicago at that time had the so-called Chicago boys. These are the free market economists, people like Milton Friedman, George Stigler, and George Schultz, a number of others. Uh, doing very rigorous academic work, and many of them actually ended up, I think some 13 of them ended up getting Nobel Prizes. So this was by far the best economics department in the country. And the thing Thomas Sowell learned is that at the end of the day, it's not really about theories. It is about how theories match up with the real world. I remember one area of his work that I learned a lot from, and I, I use this both in the liberal education, my first book, and The End of Racism, is Tom Sowell's concept of the mismatch. Because in affirmative action, you often think I'm doing a favor to a black kid uh, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of add 100 points to his SAT score. Even though he's a C student, I'm going to treat him like an A student. I'm going to let him into a college or her into a college that they wouldn't otherwise have gotten into. And, and by doing this, I'm showing my unbelievable racial magnanimity. But Tom Sowell's point is you're taking a kid who is not a bad kid, is in fact an average kid, would actually probably have done fine at 400 average institutions in the country. And you're putting them in an incredibly competitive environment where they will do poorly, they will become demoralized, they will also begin to have racial doubts about themselves. Am I not smart because I'm black? And, you're, and, and you put it in other people's minds that they're not doing well because they're black. You're doing all of these perverse effects in the name of something that you think is enlightened, or as we say now today, woke. So Sol realized that you've got to look at policies and programs for their results. Um, Sol began to study the work of the Swedish leftist uh, Gunnar Myrdal. And Gunnar Myrdal, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1974, advanced all these theories about the third world, like third world economies need to be developed through foreign aid. If you don't give them foreign aid, they're never going to develop. This was kind of one of Myrdal's premise. And Sol writes, quote, I got no sense that Myrdal actually investigated these theories of his and compared them with anything that actually happened. Because Seoul noticed that there were economies in the third world, specifically post-war Japan. Remember, Japan had been leveled to the ground. Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, the so-called Asian tigers. And they were getting no foreign aid, but they were growing dramatically. In fact, you could argue they supplied early on the model for China. The China model isn't something completely new. It is essentially the model of these Asian tigers now transferred to the largest society in Asia. So Seoul noticed that here's Mardal and he's spinning out all these theories the way leftists do without ever bothering to ask, how does this theory play out in the real world? Thomas Sowell has written, I believe now, close to 50 books. 
Um, their worth reading, perhaps his most famous, is called Basic Economics. There's another one called Intellectuals and Society. What I like about Sowell, he writes in this kind of lucid style, laced with examples. So even though he is a trained economist, he doesn't write in the dry uh, academic style. He writes in a way that you can really understand what he's saying, and you get the feeling that he is talking to you directly. Uh, he is a, an inspiration to so many of us, a kind of giant in the conservative pantheon. Um, and I'm really pleased that um, uh, Jason Riley has done this book, which is a revealing tribute to a great man, Thomas Sowell. It's a fundamental economic principle that when inflation hits, take refuge in gold. Now, in May, the U.S. inflation rate hit 5%, the highest in 13 years. And we'll see, you see it all around you. Higher fuel prices, higher food prices, higher car prices, construction costs, housing prices. Well, the list goes on. So inflation isn't just on its way, it's here. Now, have you protected your savings, your investments? If you haven't yet diversified a portion into precious metals, the answer is no. Now, for decades, I never wanted to invest in gold, just the stock market. But now I'm seriously worried about the regime we have in Washington. Washington, no sense of fiscal responsibility, whatever. Now, so listen, if all your investments are tied to greenbacks, you're sitting on a ticking time bomb, invest a portion of your savings into gold and silver. Now, Birch Gold Group, that's who I purchased from, that's who you can trust to convert an IRA or eligible 401k into an IRA backed by gold and silver. That's right, through a little known tax loophole, you can convert your retirement savings tied to the stock market into an IRA backed by precious metals. It's your hedge against inflation. Text Dinesh to 484848 for your free information kit on precious metals IRAs or to speak with a Birch Gold representative today. With 10,000 customers, an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, and countless five-star reviews, Birch Gold can help you too. Text Dinesh to 484848 and invest in gold like I did before it's too late. It's um, time for our mailbox. Let's go to our audio question for today. Listen. Hi, Dinesh. My name is Lisa. Recently on your podcast, you had a discussion about miracles where you highlighted the evidence for miracles. Given that, I had a question around miracles. Since the left has such a strong grip on our country today, dominating the media, the high-tech industry, our educational system, and all branches of our government, would you say that it would need we would need a miracle to get our country back on the right track today? Or would you say that possibly the prophecy as outlined in Revelation may be being, being fulfilled in our world today? I'm just curious what your thought process is on this. I would love to hear more what you think appreciate your podcast. I've read all your books and seen all your movies. Keep up the great work, Dinesh. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. The, um, the concept of miracles can be taken in, in two senses. And uh, in my earlier commentary discussing the philosopher Hume and discussing miracles, I was talking about a miracle that, is, that seems to be a violation of a, a kind of a natural law. And uh, in other words, something that can't happen according to at least our experience of science and uh, yet does happen and therefore is attributed or can be attributed to a supernatural cause. And um, so that's one meaning of the term miracle. A miracle in that sense is a suspension of the laws of nature or it's an introduction of a law of nature that we don't know, something that's never occurred in human experience. Uh, so, for example, take an extreme example. It is uh, against the law of nature for a, uh, a dead person, someone who's clinically dead, to come back to life. So it has to be a miracle if that occurs. Now, interestingly, a uh, hundred years from now, you could have advances in medical technology that make it such that somebody does have, is clinically dead, and can be restored, let's say, by, by medical technology. So you can bring a dead person back to life. And that means that there was never a law of nature that said that this was impossible. We simply didn't have the technology or the means to do it. And uh, now, I think your question is asking about miracle in a somewhat different meaning. 
you're talking about a miracle is a very unlikely event, just something that is like really hard to do. And your question is, you know, are we in such a mess in this country now that it would, quote, take a miracle uh, to put us back on track? So there's a little bit of bad news. and I think there's also some good news. Uh, the bad news, of course, and you mentioned it, is the left stranglehold on the culture. Now, it was one thing when they had the culture and we had the political realm. We had both branches of government. We had the presidency. We had at least a, a balance on the court. So there was, we had the politics and they had the culture. But when they have the politics and the culture, this gives them a virtual monopoly. This is how they're able to put, well, to use the George Floyd analogy, their knee on our neck. And we're kind of feeling it a little bit now. Now, the good news is, even though they're doing it, and even though they've had this cultural domination and they've been propagandizing us through the media and through the universities, they still haven't won us over. They still haven't beaten us into complete submission. It's still amazing that we get basically 50% of the vote on our side, even though they put out so much misinformation uh, and they have so much cultural control. So I don't think that we are down and out or out for the count. Debbie, when I have this discussion, I would say she's a little bit more the pessimist. I'm a little bit more the optimist. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that we have within ourselves the resources to beat these people back. We've got to fight creatively. We've got to fight differently in some respects. We've got to put in more resources. We have to go beyond the mere critique of institutions to creating institutions, by which I mean some of our own schools, our own online universities, uh, our own media, our own comedians, the whole shebang, uh, our own America. Let's put it that way. I think if we do that, we can push these people back um, and we will avert what I think you're worried about here in America, namely the apocalypse. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google and Spotify or watch on Rumble, YouTube and SalemNow.com.